Hello, my beauties. Welcome to What Magic Is This? A podcast about magic, the occult, the esoteric, the paranormal, the supernatural, and the weird. My name is Douglas Batchelor, and today we have yet another show, which was suggested by many of my Patreon supporters of What Magic Is This? As well as voted on by quite a few of them in one of the biannual episode topic Patreon polls that I run there. Now, I'm pretty sure that this isn't going to come as a surprise to anybody, but I must confess, sometimes I think I know more than I do. And our topic today is one such case. Now, I thought I knew plenty about what we will be talking about today. And then I started doing some research. And I started doing a bit more research. And then I started talking to my guest. And my goodness, I think I have only just scratched the surface. Luckily for our episode today, we have great help. So joining us is Dr. Nicholas Litursky, who is an adjunct lecturer at the California Institute of Integral Studies, a Jungian scholar, and a professional spirit guide. They are one of the authors of Method Infinite, Freemasonry, and the Mormon Restoration, which will be released in August of 2022. Welcome to What Magic Is This? Dr. Nick Litursky. Nicholas, how are you? Great. Thank you. What a wonderful welcome. Thank you. Did <laughs> that. No worries. So before we get banging into this this episode right away, um, can you give us a bit of a perspective? Because you're fairly familiar with uh, with Mormonism. So could you just maybe let us know a little bit about your experience and your perspectives of it? Sure. So I, I personally joined the Mormon church when I was 13 years old. Um, I'm one of these I was one of these strange kids that actually cared about religion and what I was hearing. And there were things in other churches that didn't sit right for me. Okay. And along came more missionaries who had different answers for some of those that appealed to me. And so I, I became involved. Um, I was devout uh, to the point of zealotry. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, so I, I spent a whole lot of time, you know, really digging into the history and doctrine. And eventually, eventually, I, I was a more missionary. I was one of those, uh, you know, young men in, in white shirts knocking on the door. Right. With a tie. Yeah. <laughs> Many years ago. And I went on and got married uh, in the Mormon temple. And uh, all this time was dealing with the fact that I was gay. Okay. And not willing to accept that for a very long time. Yeah. And, you know, as, as we all do, as we get a little bit older, uh, you know, some things are harder to just keep trying to stifle. And so I finally, you know, made the decision that I needed to step away. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, at the beginning of 2006, um, I did resign my membership in the, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Um, I still have a lot of communication with Mormon friends, uh, most of whom are sort of on the liberal end of the faith, for sure. And, and there are many things I still really love about it, uh, particularly the more esoteric aspects of it. Um, in fact, my, you know, my initial complaints about the LDS Church, honestly, were that they were sort of scuttling away the things that made them different. Right. And, and for me, it was the ritual and and the deep dives that I had enjoyed. So there's a lot of that, that I still carry with me in, in my spirituality today. Wonderful, thank you so much for sharing that. So for those of you who are unaware, as we've started this episode, we are going to be talking about the occult and esoteric influences on Mormonism. So I just want to make this a little bit clear. We are, we are not trying to judge anybody's religion. We're not trying to, to slam anything or put anything down. We are just trying to unpack a bit of history that I personally find incredibly fascinating. And our guest, Dr. Nick, has made a, a study of for a large segment of his life. So let's jump right in here. Nick, what do we need to understand before we even get talking about any of the, well, the main character? This episode has pretty much one main character by the name of Joseph Smith. But before we even talk about him, what was happening in America in the early 19th century? In the early 19th century, in the United States, we had what was called the Second Great Awakening. It was a reflourishing of religious devotion, but also a seeking. Uh, there's a strong element of seekers uh, who were trying to renew 
what they felt was lost in Christianity. Uh, it was very common at the time for people to publish uh, visions they had, uh, particularly of God and of Jesus. Uh, you, you see a lot of that in the literature of the time. And as part of this, there were a lot of proselytizing efforts uh, among various congregations and denominations. So in the area, uh, in, in a good chunk of New England, this developed in what was called the burned over district. Yeah. Because it was being just completely, utterly trampled, <laughs> if you will, <laughs> by itinerant preachers and such trying to uh, have an influence in this time of upheaval. Joseph Smith was born in Vermont in 1805 and was right in the midst of this, right from the beginning. His family later on moved to Palmyra, New York, upstate New York. It was, again, right in the thick of this. And he, in his own history, reflects on the fact that he found this confusing because all these religious pre uh, preachers and such were saying very different things. Right. And he didn't feel that he could just go to the Bible and get an answer to that. On top of that, being in Palmyra, Palmyra is close to Batavia, New York. Right. And so another you know, nationwide scandal erupted. And, and this was the kidnapping of William Morgan. Yeah. Yes. You know, we, we can't say for sure that he was killed. I think it's extremely likely. He was aced. He was killed. Yeah. I mean, In my opinion, he was yeah. killed. I mean, there are, there are terrific stories about him being moved to the Bahamas, living the rest of his life on the beach. <laughs> Paid some money to go away, right? Uh, right. Yeah. I, I think it's extremely likely that he was killed. Uh, the gist of it was there were already exposés of Freemasonry at the time, mm -hmm. but they were of the first three degrees, what's called the Blue Lodge. Okay. And he was threatening specifically to reveal the Royal Arch degrees, for which there had not been readily accessible exposés. And, and this caused a whole lot of consternation. Um, it caused uh, one of the lodges in Canandaigua, which is just, just down the road from Palmyra, really, to enter into a conspiracy. And, and they were deciding, you know, what do we do to, to shut this guy down? And so Morgan was arrested on a trivial debt and then was subsequently bailed out. They arrested him immediately on another trivial debt. Then they came and they took him from the jail. And, you know, his last words that we know of are him crying murder. Yeah, as, as they took him away. So this being the center of what became the anti-Masonic movement, there were actual pantomimes of Masonic degrees in the, in the public street. There were entire newspapers devoted to the anti-Masonic cause, as well as responsive newspapers uh, defending Freemasonry. It decimated membership in Freemasonry in the United States, but there was simply no way that a person could live in that part of the country and not have a solid familiarity, frankly, with Masonic ritual, because it was being acted out. It was being published. Yeah. It was being, frankly, ridiculed. Joseph Smith's father, Joseph Smith Sr., during this time period was placed in jail for a short time, also on a debt, ended up in the same cell with one of the kidnappers of William Morgan. <laughs> what? <laughs> and, and and tried to convert him to tried to convert him. Yeah. So yeah. this is this is the social yeah. turmoil going on. Yeah. And some really interesting things come out of how that developed. Yeah, for sure. Let's talk about the main character of of the story, which is Joseph Smith Jr. There's Joseph Smith Sr who uh, Dr. Nick just uh, just brought up. And then there's Joseph Smith Jr. Before we talk about any of the details of, of what occurred in early Mormonism and, and his life, what kind of person do you think that Joseph Smith Jr. was? What kind of character do you think he was? Honestly, to me, he was a genius. Okay. I mean, he, he was simply a, a ritual and myth-making genius, uh, which is really interesting because you have a lot of people at the time saying he basically was the village idiot. But these are people, you know, what we would call now people of privilege. Okay. Uh, they were people who were 
upset about his esoteric practices in a time where it was becoming you know uncool uh, to, to believe in those things and, and we'll get into you know what he was doing exactly but the fact is you know the fruits of what he did mm-hmm. he was a genius when when you look at his work obviously for many people that came from from god uh, but to me, even as a non-believer, I have to appreciate that genius. Yeah. He was raised to do what he did, though, from the cradle. When he was born in Vermont, his father was already very versed in Masonic legend. This was a time when people took Masonic legend as historical fact. Right. So in Freemasonry, you have the idea of a lost word uh, that is a key to, to heavenly things. Joseph Smith Sr. was having dreams and such. He, he was very interested in this. So when Joseph was born, there's actually a, a reference from other people in Vermont recollecting. He went around the village telling everybody that Joseph was born with a call, which you know, part of the amniotic sac over his face. And in folklore of the time, that meant that this person would be a seer or a prophet. So he ran around town telling everybody that, you know, his son was born with a call, that one day they would find a stone for him in which he could look and see anything in the world that he wanted to. So Joseph Jr. really is molded Mm -hmm. by his parents from birth. Was he the eldest? No, no, he wasn't. No, no. He had older brothers, Alvin, who we'll we'll talk about a little bit later. Yes, yes. The story. And also Hiram. Right. They were a poor family, were they not? Joseph Smith Sr. moved the family all over Vermont. And so they didn't they yeah. didn't have very much. They didn't. They had opportunities to get out of that mode. Mm-hmm. And, and really just one bad luck thing after another. For example, he had decided to go into the ginseng trade mm-hmm. at a time when China was using ginseng to treat the plague. And he had quite a quantity together, would have made a substantial profit, and was ripped off by a competitor and just left with the debts that he'd incurred in the process. So, yes, the family moves from one place to another, you know, several places in Vermont before they finally decide to move to Palmyra. And even in Palmyra, uh, there's struggle because I believe it was Krakatoa, one of the volcanoes. Right. Uh, of the major historical volcano eruptions that created, you know, the year without a summer. Got it. And so that in itself, you know, completely disrupted crops and and food supply. So yeah, one thing after another happens to the family during this time. And yes, they're, they are reduced to poverty. Even when they get their farm in Palmyra, they start building it. They start trying to build a house, you know, before long, they're not able to keep up on the payments for it. And they end up tenants on the farm that they have been clearing and planting and developing. There's some very interesting aspects with the the Smith family. And this is kind of where, again, I said, like, I thought I knew a lot about the story of Joseph Smith and, and how it, it relates to the occult. But this stuff completely took me by surprise. Besides Sr., Joseph Smith Sr., the family itself had some pretty occult leanings already can can we talk a little bit about just how i'm going to say the word magical they, they were a magical and occult family so what have you been able to to dig up as far as as the the smith family and their it's cunning folk it's it's mm-hmm. very it's very strange which from what i understand was fairly it was common for the time particularly in the area for people to be doing these kind of things beginning back in vermont And I've told you how Joseph Smith Sr. was very interested in Masonic legend. Yeah. Well, in Freemasonry, there is the legend that at the killing of, you know, before Hiram Abiff was killed. For people that are unaware, Hiram Abiff was the architect of Solomon's Temple. Um, So just uh, if if people are unaware, Solomon's Temple is one of the, for magic, if you don't know about Solomon's Temple, I would look it up uh, because it's fairly important to a lot of the basis in Freemasonry, as well as Solomonic magic. Basically, a lot of traditions draw from the the myth or the the history of of Solomon's Temple. Before Hiram Abiff was killed, he expected this to happen, and he engraved the the Master's word on a triangular gold plate 
which he then buried in a vault that with nine ceilings right uh, in, in deep into the ground on top of three pillars this is going to come up important later on okay but the idea is that, th- that this that there's an artifact somewhere that has this and joseph smith senior is taking this all as literal instead of figurative mm-hmm. So in this part of the country, there are, in, there are mounds that have been built up by the Native American peoples all over the place. And people are digging into these and finding treasure. They're, they're finding artifacts, some of which are very valuable. So Joseph Smith Sr. becomes involved clear back in Vermont in treasure digging. He likely got involved with a group headed by Nathaniel Wood, who were using divining rods and, and wands. Uh, which they used to receive revelation. Interestingly enough, that group called themselves Latter-day Saints. Right, really? Are you serious? <laughs> okay. Um, it definitely involved uh, some dis- uh, some of the Cowdery family who become important part of Mormonism later. Right. And uh, in their case, they had a big scandal because they declared when Jesus was coming back and it failed and and went very badly for them. So they sort of fell apart. But Joseph Smith Sr. was already involved in treasure digging. And later on, he actually has an episode when he's leading a treasure hunt in Kirtland, Ohio, which is one of the Mormon settlements. Mm-hmm. And, and he's boasting to the other people involved that, you know, oh, I, I've been doing this for 30 years. I know more. I know as much about this as anybody on the planet. Right. By the time they get into Palmyra, Joseph's mother, Lucy Mack Smith, later on went on to write a memoir that gives us a great deal of insight. And she alludes to these practices. And I'm just going to read here this little section of what she wrote. I shall change my theme for the present, but let not my reader suppose that because I shall pursue another topic for a season, that we stopped our labor and went at trying to win the faculty of a drawing magic circles or soothsaying to the neglect of all kinds of business. We never during our lives suffered one important interest to swallow up every other obligation. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah. You know, we, there is some indication that Lucy was involved in fortune telling, Uh, but certainly Joseph senior is drawing magic circles and, and treasure hunting. And the faculty of a BRAC does show up in Freemasonry. Um, as as an important charm and in magic, uh, there are deeper things about that. I know John King, I know, has written on that topic. From a sonic standpoint, at the time, you know, they sort of put out this official thing. Oh, it's a charm to help with illness. Right. Lucy Mac Smith, when she writes this, doesn't deny the practices, nor does she even downplay them. No. You know, she says we don't let one important interest overcome all the others. Right. <laughs> well, this is core to what's going on with the family. Yeah. So at this time, uh, you know, there's another neighbor by the name of William Stafford who gives the most complete description because he actually participated in one of Joseph Sr.'s treasure digs. And he talks about, you know, Joseph Sr. drawing a circle with a rusty sword and telling everybody they had to be silent. And then he's, you know, says he's muttering words as he walks around the circle. And in the meantime, Joseph Jr., who's a child of about 14 at this time, is in the house scrying. (laughs) And messages are being passed back and forth from Joseph Jr. telling them where to dig. And of course, this is a tradition that goes back, you know, at least through Solomonic magic uh, of the child virgin scryer. Yes. And so this is what he's involved in. There's also indication that Joseph was dowsing at the time. Yeah, so so the family is deeply involved in esoteric practices. They are convinced that they are going to find treasure. And on a certain level, you know, if you look at the dreams that Joseph Sr. is having, on a certain level, he's hoping to find the artifact. Right. He wants to find Enix. Uh, sorry, Hiram of Ifs artifact. Right. Uh, you know, with, with the with the master's word. Yeah, the, the gist of it is, and this becomes later important in Joseph's work. Uh, the gist is that King Solomon, King Hiram of Tyre, and Hiram of Biff 
according to Masonic legend, worked together in the building of the temple. Right. And they shared between them a key, a ma- the master's word, which they would not give to the workers on the temple until after the temple was completed. So according to the legend, three ruffians amongst the workers on the temple lost patience with this. Yeah. And they decided that they were entitled to know the master's word immediately. So in Masonic ritual and legend, they each in turn attack Hiram Abiff, yeah. trying to force him to reveal that to him. Uh, the third in that attack ends up killing Hiram Abiff. At this point, the master's word is feared forever lost because there was a pact that it could not be revealed with all, without all three Solomon, Hiram of Tyre, and Hiram of F present. Right. So without one of them, it could not be conveyed. And this is why in Freemasonry, you have a substitute word that that represents the master's word, but it's understood that it's not the actual word. We're going to dive into a little bit more about the Masonic elements uh, further on down the line, but the Smith family also had several um, parchments and even like a knife that anybody who has... I don't know who's been a magician for <laughs> a couple of months. You'll look at these things and be like, um, that's yeah. a magical document. Can you take us through uh, some of these, some of these parchments? And even, even the, even the knife is, is that's the most interesting one to me personally. Absolutely. So there are a series of artifacts uh, that were passed down through the family of Joseph Smith Jr.'s brother, Hiram, Joseph Smith Sr. And then Hiram, held an office in the Mormon church called Patriarch uh, that would then give prophetic blessings to church members about their lives. These artifacts, their provenance is a little unclear before that, but they do end up with Hiram's son and they're passed down through the generations up until fairly recently. Among these is the black handled knife. Yeah. And it is, it is absolutely a Solomonic knife. There is no question that those are the markings that are made in it. Yeah. There are also three parchments that were passed down. Two of them are really in rough condition yeah. and difficult in some ways to read. One is called the Jehovah, Jehovah, Jehovah parchment because of its markings. And the other is called the St. Peter bind them parchment. Each of them show reliance on either Ebenezer Sibley's new and complete illustration of the of the celestial science. Right. They're relying either on that or possibly ended up with a copy of uh, Scott's Discovery of Magic. But they are clearly pulling from those. Uh, there are angelic sigils in these parchments that come directly from that. The most important of the parchments is referred to as the holiness to the Lord parchment. This parchment is fascinating. It has taken a lot of time to parse the various representations in it, but it, ha- it also has seals and markings on it that draw directly on either Sibley or Reginald Scott. Uh, more than likely Sibley, from what I can tell, looking at small variations. Uh, these were passed down through the family. We cannot prove that they were in the, position of, in the possession of Joseph Smith. Uh, we simply know that they did end up in Hiram's family. And my work actually suggests that the holiness of the Lord parchment may never have been in Joseph Smith's personal possession. Okay. But that it but that it did, you know, pass through the family. Yeah. So yeah, the, the pretty magical family right from the get-go. And as I mentioned a little bit earlier, I think when a lot of people look back at this period of time, they're gonna make the argument that we're making that you know, that there were occult and esoteric influences on the founding of Mormonism and the Mormon church. This stuff was fairly common for the most part. There was a lot of this around. The burned over district, if you do any kind of research about that area, mixing folk and cunning practices with devout Christianity was common. It, there, there's no, it's not like they were, they felt bad about doing it. It was just what people did. Yeah. Yeah. This was considered sacred work. Yes. Yeah. But by, by those who were engaged in it. Absolutely. For sure. So let's talk about the big document. Um, and this is called the book of Mormon. 
Before we start to uh, slice and dice and, and get into some of the details about the composition of this, what is the official story of the Book of Mormon from the Church of the Latter-day Saints? So according to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which canonized one of Joseph's versions of his history that he wrote down, he originally had a vision of God and Jesus Christ who told him that none of the churches on the earth were correct, that they had all fallen away, and that at some point in the future, he would be instrumental in restoring pure Christianity to the earth. He was young at the time. You know, he was 14, 15 years old. You know, he acted like a 14, 15-year-old kid. Uh, but he also felt very guilty about that. And so according to the official story, uh, he was praying one night in September of 1823 and proceeded to, you know, beg for forgiveness of his sins and to know his standing with God. Suddenly a light appears above him and an angel by the name of Moroni appears. Moroni claims to be an ancient prophet who lived on this continent and tells him about a book that he and his lineage wrote on gold plates. And this, this book is hidden in a local hill, not far from Joseph's family farm. And he's told that if he is faithful, he will be able to obtain the book and go on to translate it by the gift and power of God into English as, as a witness of Jesus Christ. Right. That is the official story. So there's a couple of things that we specifically with our interests have to hone in on here. So what can you tell us about the location of where this was occurring? The, the hill itself, which I believe is called Camorra. Right. And the, and the timing uh, as to when this happened, because it happened over a period of years, did it not? It, and it was almost on the same day, on the same day over right. a period of years. Right. Yeah. So by 1822, Joseph has procured a seer stone, uh, which he sort of stole from a neighbor <laughs> nice. while he was digging a well for them uh, and is claiming to find lost items and, and see things in that and developing a reputation. So 1823 comes and the family is still actively involved in treasure digging throughout the area. So on the 22nd of September, he, excuse me, 21st of September, he decides that he's going to engage in, in some sort of heavenly manifestation. And, and there's some really interesting things about the whole story. So if you look at the official story, the Smith family cabin has been reconstructed on the original farm. And, and I have visited there before. Okay. The idea that he had this grand vision of an angel... Uh, in the upper story of this cabin, and we're not talking about a complete floor, we're talking about what amounts to an attic floor. So the idea is that he had this angelic visit three times in the night, while his very large set of siblings were all sleeping next to him, right, in a really cramped area. And, and even back then, when I saw that as a believer, I thought, wow, this is a little interesting. Right. You know, I thought, okay, fine. Maybe God made the rest of them stay asleep. You know, and I, I just kind of shelved it at the time. Right. But if you start looking into the sources, and this in, including friendly sources, such as Oliver Cowdery, who became a close associate in the translation of the Book of Mormon. Mm -hmm. Oliver Cowdery says all he desired was to, prepare, was to be prepared in heart to commune with some kind of messenger. He supposes it must have been 11 or 12 or perhaps later as the noise and bustle of the family and retiring had long since sleeped. Uh, since ceased, rather. You have to understand that at this time, people did not sleep through the night like we typically do. No. People in 19th century New England had dual shifts of sleep. So they would, they would go to sleep. They would wake up in the middle of the night and actually do things. Right. And then they would go back to sleep and, and then, you know, sleep until sunrise or so, and then get up and do their other chores. This is another problem with the narrative that this angel appears three times in the night, giving Joseph the same instructions, adding a little more each time. This is a lot of commotion for people who would have been up and about at some point. When you look at this, though, you've got Joseph Smith 
working with a seer stone. You've got the family working with lamans. Yep. You know, everything starts to come together uh, to look very much like a scrying exercise. Yeah. On top of it, Joseph chose the time. You know, Oliver Cowdery says it's about being, you know, 11 o'clock or so that night. Sunday, September 21st, 1823. The hour of the moon would have run into, and his experience would have run into Monday, the 22nd, day of the autumnal equinox. Yep. First night after the peak of the full moon. And if you read from Reginald Scott, he says, and in the composition of any circle for magical feats, the fittest time is the brightest moonlight, or when storms of lightning, winds, or thunder are raging through earth and can more easily hear the invocation of the exorcist. <laughs> I mean, it's it might seem obvious to us, but I I think that this just it it's this is as close as you get to what would be well it, to America it would have seemed somewhat new, but this is this is cunning folk, cunning folk near Solomonic evocation without right. it, like you can't deny that right. Yeah, I mean, Reginald Scott goes on and, and specifically talks about beginning at 11 o'clock at night under right. a waxing moon while Mercury reigns. Yeah. He actually refers to, sp- to burying two seals, right. which are on the holiness of the Lord parchment. Right. And he says, if, if, if he desires it, they will engage to bring him the most precious of their jewels. These are spirits that will respond. Right. And riches in 24 hours, discovering also unto him the way of finding hidden treasures in the richest mines. <laughs> On top of this, you know, Michael rules the day that he's doing this. Gabriel rules the hour. Yeah. Their sigils show up in the holiness department. Right. That's crazy. Yeah. I, so something that makes Solomonic magic or some of the tools from an early age, I believe maybe you can correct me. From an early age, Joseph Smith was called Joseph the Glass Looker. Correct. We're going to get a little bit into that. Too. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But there's other things that a lot of people that even kind of know the story of how the Book of Mormon was received. There's, tell us about um, these uh, seer stones or show stones, as well as, as hats that everybody kind of remembers the, right. the hat. So can, can you expand a little bit on this? Because I think there's also, even on top of this, even more tools uh, called Urim and Thummim. What, what's going on with them? Urim and Thummim, yes. Yeah, Urim and Thummim, yes. Yeah. So, to set that up a little bit, yeah. Joseph goes the next day to the hill and tries to get the plates. He finds them and he thinks about, you know, immediately about the financial value of them. Right. And he's struck down uh, by the angel, not allowed to get them. The angel tells him to come back the next year on the same day and bring the right person. Oh, that's right. And, the, and he's told at this time that the right person is his oldest brother, Alvin. And Alvin is the gold. He's not just the oldest. He's the golden boy in the family. Deeply, deeply loved. So Joseph plans on bringing Alvin with him to the hill next September. Only one problem. Alvin dies in November. Yeah. What's really interesting is Joseph, of course, you know, now cannot bring Alvin with him. Again, if you go back to Sibley and all these sources, uh, one of the tools to find treasure is to bring a corpse. Right. And they explain how to raise that corpse. Yeah. Within two or three days of that anniversary date, Joseph Smith Sr. puts an ad in the, or an article in the newspaper and is decrying rumors that they have dug Alvin up to have him dissect it. Okay. And he claims that he went to the grave and, you know, that they exhumed him to show that he was still there. So, yeah, so the family is enough people know what Joseph's up to. Yeah. That they at least assume he's going to dig Alvin up, whether he did or not. And, <laughs> and yeah, I mean, it's, it just gets wild. Joseph goes, he's just, that year he does not obtain the plates. He goes to the next year, he brings a local necromancer with him uh, and does not obtain the plates. But buried with the plates, the, the plates are on three stone pillars. Right. Just like, you know, the, the key of Iron Abiff. Right. On the top 
sheet of, of gold are the implements of Freemasonry, the Masonic symbols. Mm-hmm. And laying on top of that are apparently a, a set of, of spectacles. Uh, they have silver rim. They are crystal stones. Depending on what you read and which source, uh, some people say they're quite large, as if a giant had used them. Right. But for the most part, the idea is that Joseph was using these and looking through them ultimately to translate the plates. But again, he, you know, the third time he, he can't get them. Finally, in 1827, because Joseph has developed a reputation as a cunning man, he is recruited from out of state in Pennsylvania. Yeah. And this is, this is really key. A lot of people I know uh, that are critics of the Mormon church really harp on Joseph being a treasure digger. Yeah. And they say, well, obviously he was a fraud because that's all. He's a con man. He's just yeah. pure and simple. Well, what's interesting is, okay, that may, be, may or may not have been true to some extent. And yet he must have had some level of success in what he was doing because he develops a reputation that goes beyond his immediate region. Mm-hmm. And a man named Josiah Stoll, who is searching for a lost Spanish silver mine, hires Joseph and brings him up there uh, to to help with this dig. While there, Joseph boards with the Hale family and meets their daughter, Emma Hale. Emma's father hates Joseph. (laughs) The funny thing is, he hates Joseph partly because of Joseph's treasure digging, even though there was a written contract for the group doing this search for the silver mine, guess whose name's on the contract? Emma's father. There's some real hypocrisy going on because he was involved in financing this dig. Oh. But, but then he's condemning Joseph for being oh, okay. the seer to do it. Uh, <laughs> so he's not going to, you know, he won't approve the marriage. Joseph and Emma elope. Right. He brings her back to New York, to his family's farm. And he's now told that the right person to come with him to the hill is Emma. Mm-hmm. So in 1827, on September 22nd, he goes to the hill close to midnight, all dressed in black. <laughs> they go in their wagon to the hill. And by the way, the hill was not called Camorra at this time. It was just a regular hill. It's There's a hill. lot of hills. Yeah. The, the book is called that because of designation in the Book of Mormon itself. It wasn't one of the uh, the mounds, was it? No. No. There's okay. there's never been any archaeological evidence there. It was a it was a glacial drumlin. It was this piled up earth from glacial activity. Got it. But he leaves Emma at the bottom of the hill, sitting in the wagon, while he goes up to the hill, all dressed in black, and is able to obtain the plates. Right. Then begins a translation project. He's initially told to use this Urim and Thumma. Okay. And even that, you know, there, there are different stories about what form those take. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard three different people say it's a breastplate with spectacles attached. Right. They're just stones. Yeah. And- yeah. yeah. So it, it gets very unclear. Yeah. Eventually, during the translation, Joseph is trying to get support and obtains the help of a man named Martin Harris, who's a wealthy landowner. Martin Harris's wife is very skeptical. She thinks her husband's up in the night and shouldn't be doing this. Right. So he begs Joseph, let me take the initial pages of, the, of your translation and show her that this is from God. Right. And I'll convince her. He does so, and those 116 pages of the manuscript are never seen again. God. There is a rumor that Martin Harris's wife burned them. Mm. But again, it's interesting. Martin Harris was loudly proclaiming the Book of Mormon would be the anti-Masonic Bible. And it does talk about ancient people who were manipulating or, you know, false using ceremony and authority without proper uh, ability to. Got it. So, and they're, they're called secret combinations. So basically spurious masonry shows up. In, in the characters in the Book of Mormon. It just so happens that at the same time that Martin Harris is doing this, there's a big anti-Masonic convention nearby. People are coming all the way from Vermont and other parts. Palmyra's on the Erie Canal. It is it is the travel route. Right. So I think it's there's interesting possibilities about what really 
may have happened and who Martin may have mis- may have uh, shown these documents to. Right. But Joseph is left, you know, with all this work gone, and he can't, you know, t- retranslate it exactly. You know, and somebody might show up with this and, and show differences. So all of a sudden, oh, well, all this is just repeated in, in the next section of the plate. So don't worry about redoing that. Oh, okay. <laughs> that, that's the revelation is given to him. He proceeds to do this, but for a time, the plates and the Urim and Thummim are taken away from him by the angel. Right. The plates are brought back, but not the Urim and Thummim. Okay. And so at this point, Joseph is, begins using his seer stone. Okay. And in order to use that, and this even in his earlier usage, he's placing it inside a hat. He's pulling the hat up around his face to block out light. Yeah. And the description is that, that he would begin to see light coming from the stone. And that he would literally see the translation, you know, like ticker tape, if you will. I mean, got it literally be reading the translation aloud uh, which he then dictated to scribes okay so that's where you get the whole hat, stone in the hat yeah yeah huh <laughs> incredible the angel moroni from what i understand correct me if i'm wrong did the angel start off as a human being and then become an angel not unlike yes. enoch correct okay uh, in, in mormon understanding in mormon doctrine Angels are not a separate species. Okay. They are uh, former humans. Okay. In, in Mormon doctrine, for the most part. So in the case of Moroni, he was the last of a series of prophets on this continent. The Book of Mormon talks about a family in Jerusalem who were directed by God to flee before what would become the Babylonian captivity. Mm-hmm. They are told to build a boat. And they are brought to this continent and begin to settle it. Conflicts arise between the brothers in the family. And so you have Nephi, the, the good brother, and you have Laman and Lemuel, who are the, the evil brothers. Okay. So their families and followers begin to split. According to the Book of Mormon, God places a curse on the Family and, and followers of Laman and Lemuel uh, gives them a dark skin so that they will not mingle. Uh-huh. So, again, the, the the story is that these are the ancestors of the Native American peoples. Uh-huh. Over time, Nephi's followers, who have had this series of prophets, who are keeping the record that becomes the Book of Mormon, degenerate. Okay. And they reach a point where they're no longer protected by God, and they are killed off by the, what's called the Lamanites, the people of Laman and Lemuel. For sure. When the people of Nephi are dwindled, there's hardly any left. Moroni is one of these people making a last stand. Okay. And he, in his record, says, I'm going to bury this in this hill nearby, and you know, someday God will bring it forth. <laughs> Again, this this follows pretty much a standard narrative of a treasure guardian. Yeah. Uh, the only the only difference is in a lot of the treasure guardian literature, somebody's murdered for the purpose of binding them to the treasure. Mm-hmm. But you know, the presumed ending of Moroni is it is killed in battle. Okay. Uh, on the site. And and then you know, goes on to guard this treasure. Interesting. I just want to take a little bit of a, a sidetrack here and, and because I found this somewhat fascinating and I didn't know this before uh, before re- doing research for this episode, but what do you make of this idea that uh, the young Joseph Smith was very uh, enamored with stories of the real life Captain William Kidd, who uh, was a pirate. He buried treasure. Some of his treasure was actually literally found and then people afterwards thought that there was there was more buried treasure, including Joseph Smith himself. And some of the things that happen with names get a bit iffy. What do you, what do you make of all of this? So I'm not an expert on the on the on the Captain Kidd aspect of this. Okay. But yes, Joseph was was known to be a fan of the stories mm-hmm. and read a lot of the stories. And it, yes, it's interesting. There are you know island locations that are very similar to Moroni and Camorra 
the, the name that gets attached to the hill. Uh, and those, those locations still have those names today. Yeah. This is the case with a lot of what's in the Book of Mormon. There's been a lot of research done showing that he is basically drawing from his own environs. Not only that, but by this time, there's already a lot of speculation that the Native American peoples are, in fact, part of the lost tribes of right. Israel. Right. Uh, there, so Joseph has a lot to work from. You know, the apologetic defense of that is, oh, no, he was an ignorant farm boy. And he, he didn't have time to read because he was working on the farm and he wasn't that smart. So this is all God dumping on him. Right. And that's simply not what the evidence shows. No. There are too many things where Joseph is directly paralleling what's around him. And even if he hadn't read all these books, he's in the midst of a culture that has. Right. So all of these things are part of the discussion, part of the cultural conversation going on. So all of this comes together to influence what he creates. Let's continue on with the, the story of Joseph Smith as he goes along here. So has the Book of Mormon, has it translated? Does the Book of Mormon get released? And how, how, does, how does that go? And how, subsequently, what, what occurs? Because at one point, like it's, it's crazy if you understand a bit of the story. At one point, I'm skipping a way ahead here. At one point, Joseph Smith and his personal army was half the size of the United States Army. Like, how does that, how does putting your head in a hat lead to that? <laughs> get to having an army half the size of the United States' army? Well, well, I have tongue in cheek pointed out that his treasure scrying worked really well. Yeah. <laughs> um, in the long term. <laughs> so, yeah. Joseph, uh, you know, does publish the Book of Mormon uh, with the help of Martin Harris. Mm -hmm. He plans on selling the books. Uh, they are not received well. And in fact, Martin Harris ends up having to sell the farm that he mortgaged to pay off the debt for the printer. Yeah. That said, things begin to grow. Converts come. Quite a number of Freemasons are okay. attracted to Mormonism. So can I ask, when does the Freemasonic element, was it there from the beginning because of his dad? So his, his father tried to become a Mason in Vermont. Okay. And the records of the Grand Lodge of Vermont show that he was blackballed. In other words, yeah. somebody in the lodge, Federal Lodge number 15, where he was living, voted against him becoming a member of the lodge. There are different reasons that that may have happened. One was that he had a problem with alcohol at that time in his life that he later seems to have overcome. And two, that he did take these legends so literally. And that lodge uh, had future Supreme Court justices in it. it. They were a fairly sophisticated bunch. So I think they may have found him, frankly, embarrassing. Also, there were members of the lodge that seemed to have been related to the ginseng theft. <laughs> so all these things, you know, something comes together in all that mix yeah. that they don't allow him. When he moves to Palmyra, he petitions the lodge at Canandaigua. Palmyra has its own lodge, but Canandaigua is really the commercial center. Okay. It's where things are happening. It's where he can make connections. And so he petitions the lodge in Canandaigua and becomes a member. The second son in the family, Hiram, comes of age, and he joins the lodge there in Palmyra. So we have record of those. So the family does become involved with Freemasonry. As the church begins to grow, as the Book of Mormon is getting distributed, missionaries are going out, an interesting thing happens. Lucinda Pendleton Morgan remarried after the death of William Morgan, or disappearance of William Morgan, right. to a man named George Harris, who was a silversmith in Batavia. They relocate. They end up being visited by Mormon missionaries, and they embrace Mormonism. They subsequently move to be with you know the, the main gathering part of the church, which by this point is shifting into Missouri. Okay. Joseph Smith gives them a prime lot, you know, right right across the street from his own. And Lucinda, the widow of William Morgan, becomes one of Joseph's plural wives. And that gets really interesting toward the end of his life. We'll we'll talk about that yeah, a little bit. For sure. Um, like fascinating incident that happens with that. The Masonic element is, is there. Freemasons are being drawn. There's an idea with, with the anti-Masonic movement 
most of that movement is an idea from ministers and such that Freemasonry was evil and from the devil. Yeah. That's not been the thought all along. Back in 1818, Reverend Salem Town wrote that Freemasonry was a handmaid to Christianity and that a future time would come when Christianity would be restored in its perfection and Freemasonry would be restored in its perfection and they would be joined together. So that's also in the current. Yeah. So Joseph begins to model things in Mormonism based on Masonic legend. They built a temple in Kirtland, Ohio. The architecture reflects Masonic legend in a variety of ways. It reflects, reflects also the king, uh, legends of Solomon's temple. Yeah. He's going, but the Mormons are being driven from place to place. They don't get along well with their neighbors, partly because of religious persecution, partly sometimes because of their own behavior. Right. A um, little bit of an entitled God has given us this land and therefore, <laughs> yeah. That old chestnut. Yeah. So... Yeah. Eventually, 1839 enters what to me personally is sort of the golden era of Mormonism. They move into Illinois, right on the Mississippi River, in a settlement called Commerce, and rename it Nauvoo, which Joseph said was Hebrew for beautiful place. And it is. I lived there for about five years. I, I love Nauvoo. Seriously, you lived there? Yeah. Very cool. From 2005 until when I uh, came out of the closet and left Mormonism. Right. <laughs> so at this point, that Masonic element starts to come forward in even bigger ways. And one of the ways that it comes forth is all these Masons. Oh, sorry, I didn't finish the little point earlier. There was this idea that Masonic uh, Masonry came from the devil. Mm -hmm. But the other idea was that Masonry was of God and had become corrupted. Mm -hmm. And so you have a number of Masons that are in that camp that are attracted to Mormonism. Okay. By the time they reach Nauvoo, there's a good core of longtime Freemasons. There are also some anti-Masons that ended up in the LDS church. But together, they decide to create a lodge in Nauvoo. They go through the process. They petition for that. Uh, part of forming a lodge is to get the sponsorship of another lodge in the area. That lodge in the other area has to know that the people requesting the petition are Masons, not just by reputation, but by actually sitting in lodge with them and, and going through various tests of recognition. None of these Nauvoo Masons had ever visited the lodge that they asked, that they asked to sponsor them. Okay. And, and this lodge was in Quincy, Illinois, 50 miles away. The brethren at Quincy say, no, you know, we, we can't do this. We don't know any of you to be Masons. This has been interpreted as religious persecution, but it's not. It was standard no. procedure. Okay. However, the Grand Master of Illinois, who has by this time, you know, just reestablished the Grand Lodge of Illinois after a hiatus due to the Morgan incident, has aspirations in the political area. And he befriends the Mormons. There's also a family connection because one of his relatives lived with the Mormons and taught them Hebrew years before. So he leads a different lodge about the same distance away in Columbus. And, is, and they issue the recommendation. This grandmaster, Abraham Jonas, comes to Nauvoo to establish the lodge. Hmm. Some interesting things happen. Joseph Smith, who is not yet a Mason, is appointed to act as chaplain in the creation of the new lodge. Okay. He's acting as a member of the Grand Lodge. <laughs> right. But he's not a Mason. He's never, he's he's never done. No. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but then Abraham Jonas makes Joseph Smith and Joseph Smith's first assistant, president of the church, Sidney Rigdon, Masons on site. And what that means is instead of having them take one degree, go study hmm. a degree and come back having memorized the recognition and taking another degree and, you know, all these things having a time period within them, Joseph Smith gets the entered apprentice, entered apprentice and fellow craft degrees that day and is raised a master mason the following day. <laughs> and, and, and Abraham Jonas had the right to do it as grandmaster. You know, that, that there's debate about it, but fact is he could do that. Then 
Nauvoo Lodge goes off the rails. They begin basically a campaign of working toward making every male Mormon a Mason. For example, in Freemasonry, you can only vote on admitting a new member one at a time. In one instance, they had over 60 in one vote. Okay. <laughs> They're raising, you know, the, the, they are raising Master Masons in lightning speed, and the lodge is growing in huge numbers. Yeah. At the same time, like you said, Nauvoo gets its own charter under the state of Illinois, which gives it a great deal of power and authority. Right. Joseph Smith creates an, a, the Nauvoo Legion which, yes, at the time, rivals in number the standing members of the U.S. Army. At the same time, they begin building a temple in Nauvoo. The temple in Nauvoo is beautiful. It still, honestly, holds a a strong place in my heart. It very much resembles 19th century artist conceptions of what Solomon's Temple looked like, which is very different than what we think of today. Right. And he tells the people building the temple that there are certain keys of the priesthood from God that will allow you to know things and receive knowledge and revelation and to accomplish your mission, you know, for, for Jesus. Right. And that these keys will be revealed to the elders of the church once they have completed work on the temple. So this starts getting familiar. Yeah. He's re- yeah. He is reenacting the role of Hiram Abiff yeah. in the building of the Nauvoo temple. They also go on to build a Masonic Hall, which at the time was basically stunning by all accounts. Very much you know, rivaled any other in the state, and perhaps more so than that. All these things are happening. When you look in the records of Nauvoo Lodge, eventually you see that the intention Joseph had was to multiply lodges, which did start to happen, and create a Mormon Grand Lodge, independent <laughs> of, the, of the state grand lodges. At the same time, there's a movement to create a grand lodge of the United States, just as there's a grand lodge of England. Right. They call what's called the Baltimore Convention. The Baltimore Convention takes place in 1843. And by this time, the Nauvoo Lodge is getting attention. They've been investigated already. And the investigator happened to be a former grandmaster from Vermont who went about the country teaching various Masonic rituals, very likely knew some of the Smith family in Vermont. And so he comes and he says, oh, you know what? There's some irregularities here, but it's nothing we can't fix. Yeah. You know, they just need instruction. So they get past the first, in, the first investigation. Joseph eventually uh, begins to create a ritual called the endowment. Okay. He has teased that ritual, if you will, back when they lived in Kirtland and built the Kirtland Temple. And, and there, there are washings of the body. There are anointings with oil. There, there are some basic things going on. Mm-hmm. But in Nauvoo, this takes on even more Masonic character. Right. In Joseph's own diary, he talks about a meeting he had, which Jonathan Nye, this past Grand Master of Vermont, showed up at. And Joseph is talking about how there are certain keys by which you can recognize heavenly messengers. And these keys involve holding their hand in certain ways and recognizing something. Masonic. (laughs) Very much so. Yeah, yeah. Jonathan Nye had a habit of becoming part of a Masonic body, learning the rituals of that group, and then becoming the leader of it for the country. I mean, the guy was, you know, that's just what he did. He was very good. Yeah. At this point, a schism erupts between him and Joseph. It gets ugly. Another lodge asks Jonathan Nye to go to this Baltimore convention to represent them, but also to talk about what Joseph's up to, what's going on. Before the Baltimore convention can happen, Jonathan Nye is on his way across the Mississippi River to preach in a a nearby town, not preach, but uh, instruct masons in a nearby town and dies Hmm. i can tell you that i have personally tromped every cemetery in the area i've gone through every sexton record i've gone and searched newspapers i cannot find the burial of jonathan nye anywhere (laughs) just gone just gone (sighs) 
in a time when the yeah. rumor was that people were sometimes taken care of when they became problematic. Yeah. The word comes to Joseph Smith that Jonathan Nye has died, and he ba- very uncharacteristically basically says, good, this is what happens when you go up against the buckler of Jehovah's Belt. <laughs> buckler of Jehovah's Belt was codenamed for a group called the Danites. Okay. The Danites were a secret society within Mormonism. Oh, they that's oath, right. They were oath-bound. Hmm. Their ceremonies also were very much like Freemasonry. Uh, with their signals and their hand recognitions and such between them and their obligations not to share what was going on. Mm. All the circumstances point to Jonathan Nye being removed before he could go cause trouble uh, on a a national level. All this is happening. Then Joseph decides to run for president of the United States. Hey, nice. And, and, And this is the reality. Joseph was incredibly gifted and incredibly ambitious. So he's the leader, he's the president of the church, he's the prophet, he's mayor of Nauvoo, he's in charge of the Nauvoo Legion, he's the regent of the University of Nauvoo that they are establishing. Do you get a pattern here? Yeah. Okay. yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so he decides to run for president of the United States. But at the same time, again, there's this movement to create a Grand Lodge of the United States. It does not happen at the initial meeting of the the Baltimore Convention. They postpone the decision. But people are beginning to notice that Joseph is building power. He puts out a booklet on his views as a presidential candidate that are somewhat free thinking. It begins to get a little bit of popularity. But the bigger concern is what he's doing in Freemasonry. It becomes so clear that there are irregularities that the Grand Lodge of Illinois finally revokes the charter of Nauvoo Lodge. Nauvoo Lodge, which at that time is headed by Hiram Smith, Joseph's brother, basically gives them the finger and says, we're going to keep doing what we're doing. So they keep on making masons. You know, what happens from there uh, does involve, does end up involving the death of Joseph Smith. I'm not going to get too much into that because book coming out that's right that's right (laughs) so i gotta ask you this because this is my perspective is correct me if i'm wrong here but joseph smith to begin with lots of magic lots of cunning folk lots of that new world folk magic that that was around at the time starts to get popular and then does he just drop it and like oh now i'm like a mason and also anybody else who does anything that looks sort of like magic i'm going to denounce i'm going to i'm going to get rid of it is that what happens or is that an oversimplification well it's a bit of an oversimplification simplification to be okay. sure yeah joseph's magical practices you might say go underground okay brigham young later on comments that there had been an effort to bring astrology into mormonism okay while joseph smith was alive and nothing seems to have come of that. No. But what's interesting is when Joseph finally is killed by a mob, uh, two things happen. Number one, he attempts to give the grand hailing sign of distress of a master mason right before he's killed because there are masons in the mob. Right. Um, they do not respond to that according to their obligations. They respond with gunfire. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but when he's killed... An inventory is taken of his belongings on his person. And among that, there is a comment of, you know, several coins that are are not specified beyond. His widow, Emma, ends up remarrying a man named Charles Bitterman. And really is is really quite wonderful to to Charles Bitterman's family. Their son, Bitterman's son, her stepson, survives both of them. But Emma gave him a few artifacts from Joseph, one of which was a Jupiter talisman that Joseph, that she said that he had it on his person when he died. She calls it his Masonic piece and Mm -hmm. says it was very precious to him. Mm -hmm. We know for a fact that Joseph took that from the Magus. And the reason we know is it's actually this... This Jupiter talisman right here. Yeah. And if you look closely, there's a break in the yeah. sign of the intelligence of Jupiter here. Right. That's a misprint. That's right. 
That's right. Joseph's talisman has the gap. Has that break. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so that talisman has gone down. Uh, it was acquired by a name of a man by the name of Wilford Wood, whose thing really was to go out and acquire land and artifacts for the Mormon church. Yeah. And it ended up in his personal family museum. There has been effort to distance that from Joseph. Yep. By religious apologists, but you know, every everything really suggests Joseph is born under Jupiter. Mm-hmm. It lines up. <laughs> yeah, for sure. It really looks like Joseph continued. What's interesting is, you know, the Magus came out in 1801. Yeah. Originally, it was never reprinted until 1875, which is what this copy is from. Right. The question obviously arises, well, how in the heck does this land in Joseph's hands? And we don't know. The only thing I can find is Joseph did go on some preaching missions. One of them was to Salem, Massachusetts, where God told him to inquire after the history of the founders of that area. Okay. And his response to that was to go to museums and such. And you can actually find his name on guest registers. That's crazy. (laughs) He later goes, does the same thing in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. There's no indication that he's given a similar similar, uh, revelation there, but he spends about a month and a half. And it just so happens, but by that time, the Free Library of Philadelphia has been well established. It still survives today. And they had a copy. Of Francis Barrett's The Magus, yeah. Yes. And I have written to them in hopes that they had a guest register for the time. Okay. Unfortunately, they do not. But they absolutely confirmed that they had it in the collection at the time. They they even told me where they obtained it. You know, that would have been one possibility. And, and in fact, she, the librarian that helped me said, even now that book is frequently consulted. <laughs> it's a hit. It is. Let's talk a little bit about Francis Barrett's The Magus. So for people who don't know, this is a, it's a late... I'm going to say a late grimoire. It was published in 1801 by Francis Barrett. We don't know a ton about his life. I mentioned in a podcast uh, earlier, I think it was my fourth uh, book of occult philosophy, that he might have died in a ballooning accident. I've since done research since that episode. They don't know how he died. He might have moved to America. We just know. There's one item that says he might have died. Very interesting guy. But all of the information in this book is basically taken from Agrippa for the most part. What's interesting about what you say is that you don't think that he consulted this book until a little bit later on in his life, until maybe he was 30 or so. I'm saying I don't know. Okay. You know, the the fact is the holiness of the Lord parchment Mm -hmm. does have material from Magus. Yeah. Yeah. But there's some, there's some challenge as to whether Joseph Smith personally ever had the holiness of the Lord parchment in his possession. Okay. Again, this, this, this comes down through his brother's line. The thing about the holiness of the Lord parchment, it contains an astrological chart that was constructed after the directions given by Ebenezer Sibley. And Ebenezer Sibley was famous for his horoscope of the the United States. Right. right. Your natal chart, I should say. So if you look at the holiness of the Lord parchment and you pay attention because it has, has the symbols of all the planets that were known at that time, has the symbols of the astrological symbols. One key to that is a Jupiter-Saturn opposition, which really helps to narrow down the time that it was created. Okay. And without getting into all the details, yeah. <laughs> generally these things were created either in relation to an event, such as the ritual it was going to be used for, right, or somebody's birth. It does align, I I will say this much for now, it does align with the birth time of a close relative. Okay. Joseph. Okay. And and forgive me if I don't completely. Uh, Absolutely. (laughs) I will eventually write on it. (laughs) Amazing. (laughs) This is so interesting to me when you meant, because 
Dr. Nick and I have been talking kind of over through a Google document a little bit. He wrote down that this holiness to the Lord parchment, which I had never seen before, like this, this stuff completely blew my mind. And particularly even, have you seen this, uh, Nick? The, the knife that the family has also has a symbol on it from the Magus. It's, it's got from the Mars, uh, right. talisman. And right. it's it's from the backside, which Mars is supposed to be made out of iron. It's got a symbol from that. So it's one of those things where part of me, part of me thinks that the family somehow had either somebody took notes from the Magus or because there's yeah. there there is a there is a one neighbor account that suggests that in Joseph's early years, a necromancer came through town. Uh, who had quite a reputation. His, his big reputation, apparently, he had just a filthy, filthy mouth. Okay. <laughs> How dare he? I like this guy already. I mean, I mean, like they, they're talking about him, like almost in awe of his ability to swear. It's funny. Nice, nice. But there is a suggestion that you know some itinerant necromancer, most likely the same one, came through with certain books. You know, that could have been their exposure there. Mm-hmm. But again, the, these books are in the culture. You know, they didn't have to own them personally to, to end up finding them and seeing them. And, and when I talk about, you know, the Magus being in the library of Philadelphia, yes, that's later. Doesn't mean that he never saw it until then. Right. To me, that's an interesting question because, again, the religious answer to this is you can't prove he ever saw that book. Right you look for opportunities that may have arisen yeah. but you're right you know the, the artifacts in the family do suggest you know much earlier exposure yeah the most famous part of francis barrett's the magus our nun is called drawing spirits into crystals right. which taken from aspects of Peter de Abano's The Heptameron, which is listed in Agrippa's fourth book of occult philosophy. Francis Baird attributes it to the um, the abbot of Spontheim, Johann Trithemius. But this is like one of those things where, of course, if you go through everything that Barrett has for drawing spirits into crystal, it's a pretty, pretty complex process. And I think that um, one of the authors of a book that we use for research for this episode is called The uh, The Angel and the Sorcerer by Peter Lavenda. He makes a good point and basically says, like, look, when people start out doing magic, we try to do, I'm going to use the word high ceremonial magic, but we make shortcuts. We try to, we do things simply, we exclude things and we we add things as we can. And there's something that, about everything, particularly because... Cunning folk tradition only goes so far, especially when it hit the new world. What the Smith family were doing seemed to cut above. And that's all that's that's all that I, I can glean from the situation. I don't know what your opinion would be. Yeah, they, they took it seriously. Yeah. Yeah. And I and I I really believe as much as I've dug into the appearance of Moroni, <laughs> um, you know, honestly, for me, as somebody who's no longer a believer in the religious claims, right? That was a bit of a eye opener. I am personally convinced that Joseph engaged in a trithemian working, seer stones, lamans. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think, frankly, it, does, it makes no sense that he was in the upper room of his house. I think he was out on the farm in the woods, yeah. drawing a circle like his dad did. Yeah. But I think everything there points to a trithemian working, seeking a treasure spirit. I think Joseph had an experience. Yeah. Now, where you cut, where you draw the line between what happened in his magical working and what he embellished, who knows? Who knows? Exactly. Yeah. I think he engaged in a tr- an attempt to tr- to scry a treasure spirit, and did have some kind of an experience from it. Yeah. There, there are a whole lot of really interesting things. You know, this holiness of the Lord Parchment makes reference to virginity. A couple of the angelic sigils on there are specifically to protect young virgins. <laughs> and mind you, just because we have these three parchments does not mean they were the only ones the family had. It means it's the right. ones that survived. S- survived, right. This is the symbol symbol group the family's working with. Yeah. What's kind of fascinating, just in the speculative realm, Joseph marries Emma, 
And eventually they go and they get the plates on the next September date. Their first child is born right at nine months after that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Unfortunately, the child is stillborn and, and quite deformed. Oh, really? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, huh. But on the one hand, um, do I think it's likely that Joseph kept himself ritually pure right for that time period that seems unlikely right yet it's awfully and yet it's awfully interesting <laughs> oh my god so, so yeah there's, there's so much in this story that yeah. can unfold as i continue to dig yeah and yeah i have method infinite coming out i am working on another book right now that does not deal with mormonism mm -hmm. My next project after that is dig into Joseph's magical practices as, as a book of its own. So I want to put an end cap on, on the story of Joseph. Joseph's story doesn't particularly end uh, after he's after he's killed and with the talisman. The, what, what, what was it about his burial that's interesting to you? The burials are fascinating. Mm -hmm. So Joseph, when he's having the temple built, he also laid down plans to have a tomb for himself and his family right. on the temple. And a very good friend of mine has done a lot of research on the tomb and because it was lost yeah. for decades. And he, he believed that he's found this precise location of it. Nice. But the problem is that the tomb was basically ready when Joseph was killed. But by that time, the mob had a price on Joseph's head, mm. literally his head. So they were afraid that his body would be tampered with if they buried him in, in the tomb as intended. So what they did, they laid out him and his brother Hiram, who was killed with him, in Joseph's home, which was called the mansion house at the time. Hundreds come through. An out-of-town individual who comes in to investigate the Mormons and just happens to hit at this time where everything is going crazy. Uh -huh. just yeah. But one thing he knows, and this is uh, Mr. Richmond, one thing Richmond knows is that William Morgan's widow became a Mormon and she's in Nauvoo. Right. He writes about visiting her and how everything's in turmoil. The Mormons are afraid they're going to be driven out of Nauvoo like they've been driven out of other places. And she has a copy of an anti-Masonic expose laid out on the table when he comes. And it has a picture of William Morgan, an engraving of William. He identifies the wrong book. He identifies another popular book that does not have that engraving. Okay. But she has this book. And, you know, 1844, it's, you know, photos weren't no. around. This is the only image she has of her first husband. And she's saying how, well, if they're forced to go into the river and cross into Iowa, she's going to take that with her. Okay. Th that starts the interesting thing. Then Richmond goes to the viewing of Joseph and Hiram Smith. Imagine this. You've got the two bodies laid out in the dining room in front of the windows. You have their mother kneeling down in between them, her hands on them, crying and wailing. You've got Emma, his wife, who barely managed to come into the room, right. you know, hanging on to the people supporting her. Yeah. But standing at the head of Joseph's casket is a lovely blonde woman, all dressed in black and veiled, weeping, Lucinda Morgan. <laughs> Lucinda. Uh, yeah. And, and, you know, that's a position of honor. I mean, it's like, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So oh, after the crowds and there's hundreds of people come through to the bodies yeah. afterward, they close the doors and they hide the bodies in a closet. They bring up, they fill the coffins with, with rocks and they bring them out and they have a funeral procession that goes out to the Nauvoo cemetery, which is quite a, quite a walk. Yeah. They bury these coffins that supposedly have the bodies in them, but again, they're, they're stones. Right. That night at midnight, they take the bodies, they go out across the street to what's called the Nauvoo House. The Nauvoo House was a hotel that Joseph Smith said God commanded him to build to welcome the nations who would come to Nauvoo. Of course. This would also have living quarters for the Smith family in it. Okay. 
at this time, the walls were up for the first story, but construction had been interrupted with all the turmoil going on. Right. Now, in the legend of Hiram Abiff, the first thing the ruffians do is go out to the brow of the hill and hide the body under yes. debris. At midnight, Emma Smith has a group of men, all of whom are Freemasons, take the bodies and bury them in a shallow grave in the corner of the Nauvoo house. And if you go to the Nauvoo house, even today, it is on the very edge of the rise in land before it drops to the Mississippi River. Right. <laughs> After this, Harry Beth's body was found and reburied. And sure enough, after a few months, plans begin coming together to resume construction. Right. And Emma and Hiram's wife, Mary, are afraid that the bodies will be discovered. Right. So again, at midnight, they are moved. <laughs> this time, placed under a bee house mm -hmm. on the homestead property nearby. The bee being a Masonic symbol of That's right. resurrection. The hive. Right, yeah. the hive. Yeah. And later on becomes an important symbol in Mormonism as well. Oh. <laughs> so... In a nutshell, you have these several movements of Hiram's body until he finally is buried in a sepulcher with a marble monument and the statue of a beautiful woman weeping and it's representative of time. Right. This is what happens with Joseph. Joseph is again moved and buried outside town on a close associate's farm where Joseph's son ends up going. <laughs> several times his favorite place to go. Okay. And eventually they bring him and Hiram back to that homestead property. They again bury him on the property with another outbuilding on top of it. In time, a dam is built nearby in Keokuk, and it's going to threaten to flood the area where they've buried the bodies. Oh. By this time, it's the 1920s. Right. And so the president of the what was then called the Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, group that broke away from the larger body, owns that land. And so he said, we have to find the bodies and relocate them. He's, they send experts out. Allegedly, there is prayer and revelation involved, <laughs> finally locating the bodies. And they are reburied on the site in beautiful marble tombs yeah yeah that, that exist to this day yeah are they there are they actually there yes yes there okay yeah what's interesting is there are three graves in this monument joseph hiram and emma right and there is some suggestion that they may have mixed up joseph and hiram's bodies they may be in the wrong spots uh -huh. but that's neither here nor there they're all they're all there okay Joseph's right in the middle, right? If, I, if my memory collects, it's Hiram, Joseph, and then Emma uh, from left to right? I believe so. I'd have to double check on that to okay. be too sure, but yeah. yeah. Huh. But yeah, I mean, you know, it's, again, the, the book gets into this more, more precisely, but yes, there's this yeah. pattern of, of burials right. in the legend of Hiram Biff, and those reburials happen at, you know, low mm. midnight. Right. The same thing is happening with Joseph. So even <laughs> Emma seems to have some concept of, of these legends being played out in right. just yeah. when i originally started my book i was still a believing member of the lds church mm -hmm. and i had become a mason and honestly i i had spent so much time reading joseph smith's sermons and the history of the church that in masonic ritual i kept pinging right. <laughs> <laughs> <Huh>. <laughs> yeah, and you know from perhaps a bit of a naive perspective i thought oh gosh maybe freemasonry has been a prophecy all along you know and, and i went on to learn a lot more <laughs> no <laughs> doubt that, that shifted that perception nonetheless the correspondences many of which are clearly intentional some perhaps not intentional are played out so heavily mm -hmm. and of course you know, the Mormons are forced out of Nauvoo. They are expelled from Freemasonry. They're declared clandestine. Brigham Young ultimately pretty much shuts it down. Right. Uh, they, they considered, you know, creating a lodge in Utah. Brigham Young vetoed the idea. 
uh, partly because Masons had been involved in Joseph's death. By this time, there was a sense among some Masons that Joseph had essentially stolen their rituals. And so for many, many years, Mormons were forbidden, not just by their church, but by Freemasonry itself from becoming members. That has right. unfortunately changed. Yeah. You know, I was the first Mormon in Hancock County, where Nauvoo is, to become a Mason since <laughs> 1940s. <laughs> Jeez. That's awesome. <laughs> um, let me just give you an idea of time frames. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, it's it's a fascinating story. It is. And to me, you can't just say that Joseph, you know, stole ritual because he didn't. He repackaged, he altered, he changed. This is where I see the genius. Mm-hmm. And, and I think it's a combination of his magical work. The Navu Temple has these beautiful windows across the top level that are inverted pentagrams. Oh. <laughs> um, and of course, you know, now some people are like, oh, Satan, you know, you know, they don't understand. They don't, no, don't get it. Yeah. It wasn't attributed by Elephus Levi at that time. Right. But yeah, I mean, these images and ideas and such come up. And so what you have is a product of Freemasonry, magic, all these influences coming together. For me, that's that's what I actually treasured was that esoteric aspect. This doesn't come as any surprise, but what do you make of the fact that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints want to distance themselves as much as possible from any of this magical, in their eyes, tomfoolery? Well, again, you know, it, there's a cultural shift mm-hmm. that really was beginning even in Joseph Smith's time, but has become much more so associating magic, you know, as, as anti-Christian. Yeah. And also they're, they're very invested in Joseph's prophetic legacy. Unfortunately, there's this, there's this idea that everything Joseph did must have come dropped out of the sky in a sealed box. Right. And that's unfortunate because to me, you can even go from a, a believer's viewpoint and say, fine, you know, God used all these influences around Joseph to guide him. Mm-hmm. You know, as a believer, you can take that, that viewpoint. <laughs> so, but, but yes, unfortunately, the defenders of Mormonism have been very invested in distancing him from any outside influences. Because from their perspective, those cast doubt on him being inspired. Like I said, you know, something was going on. I don't think you can say he just put things together. At the very least, I think you have to say he was a genius. Yeah. I think he was an incredibly creative person. I also agree with you completely. I think that he did have an experience. Mm -hmm. And I think, I hope this doesn't come off as being cynical. I do think that he saw this in this experience and being surrounded by what was happening with the, the, the Second Great Awakening and all of this. He saw it as an opportunity, but he was sincere. He was sincere in in how they had that experience. It's just the way that he wanted to have other people relate to them using what was happening at the time. That's when the storytelling element gets pretty, um, you know, like the, the for me, the Captain Kid stuff is pretty damning. Like the name of these islands that Captain Kid went to were the Comoros Islands. The capital of that is Moroni, spelled the exact same way. But that, to me, shouldn't damn the entire enterprise. Right. I think that it shows, it shows in equal measure the magic and the human aspect of these experiences. And it shows you as much as what was happening at the time as well. Yeah. And keep in mind, you know, it's so easy to make that comparison because Mormonism is, is historical. Right. We, we have, you know, what were the neighbors saying and all these things. Right. So, so to say that this is different somehow from the establishment of other major faiths, you know, is simply a matter of lost history in many cases. Right. Right. You know, we, we, we don't know. I mean, even as a believer, you know, I, I do not identify as Christian anymore, but even as a believer, I always found it unfortunate that, you know, the Bible, for example, takes on these prophets at the height Right. Instead of whatever crap, whatever shit they went through to get there. Right. Yeah, you know, that that's the story that should be interesting. But no, it it focus they focus there. 
you know, Joseph just has the disadvantage of, of being readily <laughs> investigated. <laughs> yeah. Even at the time, I forget, correct me if the name of the book, uh, was it uh, Mormonism, Mormonism Unveiled? Um, right after everything was going down, there were people already throwing mud and, and, and yeah, it was, it was, it's been an interesting situation. Oh my God. Have we, have we ticked all the boxes? Because I, truthfully, I think people, if you start investigating this stuff, it gets even crazier. I'll mention a couple of things and you can look them up. Salamanders, a gentleman by the name of Mark uh, Hoffman with a whole other situation involving forged documents that were bought up by it. Things get incredible. And here's the thing. When I, when I tell people, I believe that we should try to get the history of magic right because I believe it is a real thing. This is a modern story that has so much going for it that I think that if you are interested in magic, this should be something to look into because there's so much. Is, is there anything else, uh, Nick, that did we miss anything that's majorly or crucial to this story? I don't know about crucial, but you know, I, I just, one thing I, I find sort of fun is, is Alistair Crowley even had something to say about Joseph. He loved Mormonism. <laughs> he says, history affords innumerable examples of the lofty intelligence and the noblest characters shooting up from the grossest stock. <laughs> Joseph and an innumerable other man of the highest genius came a peasant parentage. <laughs> and, and, you know, it's Crowley, take it, you know, what, what you will. Right. But it's interesting. Yeah. Clearly, even he recognized the monumental level of what Joseph did. Yeah. And the reality is he created a religious system that has worked for millions of people. Yeah. Not for everybody, you know, certainly. Yeah. But there it is. I, I think a certain respect is, is due that. My involvement in magic comes from Joseph. Because these things started coming out in the late 80s. Right. Uh, because of Hoffman's forgeries. Yeah. Even back then, I, I got a cop, a cheap paperback reprint of the Magus and was trying to figure all this out. And, and it made no sense to me no. at the time. No. And it was you know much later after I'd left Mormonism that I was able to start digging. And it's like, oh, this makes sense when you're doing it. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it's, it's a fascinating story. And, and of course, there's so much more than we could tell on this time. Yeah. Method Infinite started out as a 900 page manuscript. Oh, man. It's now, a 500 page book because we just had to, yeah. you know, we had to trim, but there's so much more to the whole story. So tell us about this book. Tell us what, what's, what's the story behind this book and, and is it available yet? Give us, give us everything. Sure. So the title of the book is Method Infinite Freemasonry and the Mormon Restoration. And that title comes from one of Joseph's plural wives, Eliza R. Snow, who allegedly later made the comment, Mormonism has method, method infinite. Mormonism is Masonic. Ah, there you go. <laughs> so, so, you know, I pulled that into the title. I began the project in 2002. I went all over the country uh, researching in original records. Uh, because I was a Mason, I was able to get access to records that, I may not have been able to otherwise, just because I was able to get uh, instant friends. <laughs> there you go. With a handshake and a wink. Pretty much, yeah. Yeah. And you know, I, I began gathering all this together. Uh, I had finished a little over 100 pages of the manuscript and compiled a huge amount of research when I you know, came out of the closet and, and left Mormonism. Part of that was, you know, coming out of the closet. Part of it was just that this work and realizing how Joseph had molded the religion kind of gave me a different perspective and honestly left me space mm -hmm. to, to deal with other things. I, at that point went on and I was rebuilding my life. And so I kind of had a hiatus and eventually I, I knew it needed to be done. I passed everything over to a good friend, Joe Steve Swick, who was also a Mormon and a Mason. And uh, Joe subsequently met and married Cheryl Bruno, uh, who became involved in the project. So it's ended up, you know, a 20 year old gestation with three parents. <laughs> <laughs> and Cheryl, Cheryl did finish the majority of the manuscript okay. by far. Okay. Uh, 
but you know, it all comes out of those initial years of research. And it really shows how Joseph was shaped by and how he used Freemasonry from cradle to the grave. It's just a fascinating story. Absolutely. So it, it will be available on August 9th. It is up right now for pre-orders on Amazon and, and on the publisher and other sites as well. Perfect. And I'm, I'm excited to see it come out. Me too. I can't wait. Yeah. If, if any part of this story was fascinating to you, and I know we have a lot of listeners who are Masons, and if I know most of you would be like, yeah, yeah, I know a little bit, but Joseph Smith and Mormonism, you've heard the episode. Nick knows what he's talking about here. This has been a long time and a lot of work put in. So yeah, I, I can't wait for this to be released. Nick, you also do uh, spiritual guidance. Can you tell us a yeah. bit about Dancing Ancestors and what you do there? Sure. So um, after leaving Mormonism and taking on my own exploration in faith, I ended up pursuing a master's degree in spiritual guidance, Perfect. which in turn introduced me to Jung. And I went on to receive another master's degree and a PhD in depth psychology with an emphasis in Jungian and archetypal studies. And so what this has led me to do is really bring spirituality and psychology together. And, you know, magic comes into that as well, as far yes. as I'm concerned. Because yeah. <laughs> I, I don't, you know, people talk about, is it real? Is it psychological? Yes. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> but Dancing Ancestors is, is all about that exploration. It, it is bringing psychology and spirituality together and allowing people to, or assisting people in exploring their own spiritual path and, and how that's unfolding for them. So I do a lot of reflective listening, a lot of helping people, you know, to really do their own exploration. I also do, you know, my own writings and uh, we'll, we'll be going on. I'm, I'm working on a, another book right now. Working title is Paleo Spirituality, What Our Earliest Ancestors Can Teach Us About Spiritual Practice. Cool. <laughs> that has its, uh, has its birth in my dissertation work, okay. which was... Uh, psychological analysis of 36,000 year old cave art with an eye toward what it told us about the religious instinct. Very cool. Is there any timeline for that book to come out? Um, I am hoping to have the manuscript finished by the end of the year. Amazing. And <laughs> I am already talking with, with, uh, you know, potential agents and such. Uh, so, you know, I'm eager. Me too. Uh, to come forward. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the next project after that will be, I, I'm getting a lot of encouragement, including from the publisher of Method Infinite, uh, to do a book on Joseph as ceremonial magician, because <laughs> the work that's been done, yeah. um, you know, the, the sorcerer, the prophet and the sorcerer, whatever it was that you mentioned. The angel and the sorcerer. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. The angel and the sorcerer has some real deficits. Yep. It didn't even get Joseph's wife's name right. No. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> the masterwork, if you will, is a book by D. Michael Quinn called Early Mormonism and the Magic Worldview. Yeah. And Quinn was, you know, the dean of Mormon historians, brilliant, brilliant scholar who just passed away about a year ago. But he was not a magician. No. And so he discovered many important things. He missed a lot of important things. And sometimes he misinterpreted things. And, and so there is place, just as with Method Infinite, it, that's the first work written by people who know both Freemasonry and Mormonism intimately. Okay. Instead of people on one group or the other, what I hope to write about Joseph's ceremonial magic will come from a deep familiarity with Mormonism and my continually growing familiarity with magic. Amazing. This has been so much fun, Nick. Where can people find find your work? Uh, dancingancestors.com is my website. Um, you can also find me on uh, Facebook as, as Dancing Ancestors, the work of Dr. Nick Lachersky. And um, if anybody wants to reach out to me, they can feel free to email me. It's nick at dancingancestors.com. I will have links for the places in which to find Dr. Nick's new book, as well as a link to his website, Dancing Ancestors. So please head there for all things Dr. Nick. Those will be available at the show notes at whatmagicisthis.com. Lots of really great show notes for this one. If this was interesting to you, this episode, the show notes for this one are awesome. I spent literally two days going through all of these crazy links 
They're great. So I, I, I try to pride myself on my show notes. I'm pretty proud of the show notes that I found for this one. So please have a look at those at whatmagicisthis.com. Also on whatmagicisthis.com, you can find my Twitter account as well as my Facebook account and my Instagram account. I'm fairly active on Twitter and uh, not so much on Facebook or Instagram. But if you do follow me on Twitter, I usually have links to pretty interesting stuff. I don't really talk too much on Twitter, but uh, it's there if you want to see uh, interesting art and interesting historical links and all of that kind of thing. If you enjoy the podcast, please tell a friend, and then hopefully they'll tell a friend, and they'll tell a friend, and that's how this whole word of mouth thing gets going. I don't really do a lot of my own you know, publicity, so word of mouth is kind of my favorite way of of getting the show out there and people finding it, so that would be really appreciated. What would also be appreciated is if you love the show, please put up a review on either iTunes or Spotify or Stitcher or any place that you can, particularly iTunes. Don't write a whole essay about how much you enjoy what magic is. This maybe just, I don't know, two or three sentences just saying you enjoy what Doug does. Uh, he's got a sexy voice. He's the Dan Carlin of occult podcasting, all of those kind of positive things. If you have something negative to say, uh, keep it to yourself. But otherwise, please leave a review for me. People do read those reviews and um, they might click it and be like, ah, oh, this sounds like my kind of thing. I'll listen to this podcast. It would be greatly appreciated. If you think that I'm doing something special here with What Magic Is This and you want to support the show in some way, I've got three ways of doing that. So hang in there. We're going to take you through it. I know I do this every episode, but um, it's got to be done. So the first way of supporting the show is the best way, and that is through Patreon. Patreon.com slash What Magic Is This or head to What Magic Is This and find any one of the Patreon stickers there. They're all over the place. Just click on the link and you'll go straight to my Patreon page. I only ask for $7 a month. That is seven bucks a month. That is it. And it gives you access to all kinds of exclusive material, all kinds of episodes, like more audio content from me. I have video content. My Patreon account is almost like a whole other podcast. There's tons of stuff there. I'm trying to put up as much stuff there as I do with the main podcast. It is my favorite stuff. I have episodes about saints like St. Saint Expedite as well as St. Cyprian. I did a video about how to find the proper timing for your rituals, how to set up an ancestral altar, make your own incense. I go all over the place and that is truly my favorite, I, because you get to see a little bit more of how I come at magic. I mean, I don't really follow anybody's like guidance. I'm not a thelemite anymore. I don't dig the golden dawn. I'm, I don't really call myself a ceremonial magician. I've been doing magic for nearly 20 years, and I really want to share how I come at magic. And the best way of seeing that is through my Patreon account. Again, $7.00. I only have one tier, so either you support the show or you do not, and it gives you access to so much exclusive stuff as well as a opportunity to join my Discord server. We got a lot of really great people there, people who have been magicians for almost as long, and if not longer than myself, as well as people who are brand new and just wanted to ask questions. So it's really wonderful. It's a great little community, and please, if you think that I'm doing something cool, Patreon is literally the best way of showing your support. $7 a month. There's my pitch. Take it or leave it. Another way of supporting the show is through PayPal. And PayPal, I have links all over whatmagicisthis.com. Click on any number of them. You can donate $5, $10, $20, $500. It is all good. And it goes right back into sponsoring this show and literally keeping the show active because it's expensive. I mean, a lot of people can do podcasts for, you know, not very much money. I, I try to pay out really good sounding content and with like a lot of space and I use pretty high quality audio on my podcast and that stuff costs money. I literally am looking at how a bunch of my plugins are now obsolete because the tech company was just sunset. So I have to go looking and I'm looking at dropping another 250 bucks. So this kind of stuff, it's not cheap. And so if you donate through PayPal, that goes right back into keeping the fires here at What Magic Is This stoked. And yes, it keeps the hamster on the hamster wheel. It keeps the um, uh, bread in the oven. I don't know. It, it just, it really goes right back into the show. So that's also available at whatmagicisthis.com. And the last way of supporting the show is by wearing your support or showing your support out in public. Well, you don't really have to, but uh, I have a merch store. Go to whatmagicisthis.com, click on the menu, 
Fine merchandise, you can buy t-shirts, mugs, tote bags, notebooks. I love my notebooks. My, of all the things that I put out, my notebooks, I'm the most proud of. They're great. They're the they're, they're perfect size. They're really wonderful. But also tote bags, fridge magnets. Oh man, there's a lot of stuff there. I don't have underwear yet, but one of these days I'm going to try and put out some what magic is this underwear. Can you imagine having what magic is this underwear? Just like just says what magic is this right on the, uh, well, anyways, use your imagination. But anyways, not yet, but any of the other kind of merchandise, t-shirts, it's all there. Uh, yeah, you wear the t-shirt out and people will be like, what magic is this? And you'll be like, hey, it's a podcast. Listen to it, chump. And they'll be like, no, nah, you just called me a chump. Ah, I forgive you. And then they'll listen to it. Anyways, I'm rambling. Uh, it's really hot where I am. So the heat's really getting to me. And the hotter it is where I am, the more rambly and weird and nonsensical I get. So thank you all for hanging in there um, for for this promo. But that's it. Uh, Truthfully, I'm going to say it one last time, at least for this episode, Patreon is where I want to see you. If you donate through PayPal, you do not get access through the Patreon exclusive material. Um, $7 a month, that is where I want to see you. It's great. It, As I said, it is almost like a completely different podcast. And uh, it's it's fun times. You get to see my face. Uh, I think I'm a pretty attractive guy. I've been told by more than 11 people that I'm fairly attractive. So uh, if you if if you think that's uh, you know something to go on, uh, the best place to see that is uh, is through the Patreon. Get to see me live. Um, yeah, I just uploaded a little travel video. It was wonderful. People loved it. It was great. Anyways, all of these things, every single bit of it, is available at whatmagicisthis.com. We'll see you over there. I have had an incredible time. This story, it's one of those things where even after this episode gets released, I actually kind of want to keep reading into it because, oh my so much, God. There's so much more to the story. <laughs> there is, and it's and it's seamless. Like I Just last night before we were going, I was looking into the, t- the tomb stuff, the tomb of, of Joseph and how people have been looking for this tomb. It's... That's two less than two hundred years ago, and people are like, "We don't know where it is." So, right. yeah, it's incredible, an incredible story. Nick, this has been so much fun. If we ever wanted to have you back on the show, I hope that you'd say yes because I've I've had such a great time. Of course, absolutely amazing. So, I hope everybody really got something from this episode, and I and I truly hope that if you were a little bit skeptical at the beginning, like I don't know if this kind of seems like a little bit boring, I hope that we stuffed enough interesting information in your ear holes because. Again, I th- I thought that I like I I know the story. I, yeah, Joseph Smith, cunning cunning folk, a lot of lot lot. And but just like the knife was the knife and the parchments really threw me for a loop. It's like it was he was part of a pedigree of magic. <laughs> Incredible. Absolutely, absolutely. That is the episode, everybody. I really hope you enjoyed it, and thank you again, uh, Nick, for for everything and all you did. And I hope people really check out your work and check out Method Infinite. But that's the show. And come on back to what magic is this? We're going to be talking about more of this, this buried, scrying, maybe ceremonial, maybe magical, everything all stuffed into one wonderful product that is the podcast, What Magic Is This? Until next time, I want each and every one of you to stay healthy, stay hopeful, and stay luminous. We will talk at you soon. Goodbye, everybody. Bye-bye.